he, here's the thing. My approach, what I'm talking about, how people are talking about the industry now, is the way that I looked at the industry 35 years ago. So you never changed it. No. Yeah. It's like I thought that the industry was insustainable the during it its gone. heyday. Uh, okay. It was, obviously. Right? So I remember going to a club. I'm going to say this is about 88, 89. By this point, Total West Sprockets already been signed at Columbia, and every label in town wanted of them. So they were looking for another. What else you got? You got another one of those? And it was like, I'm not doing that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not, uh, it, it, that, that isn't how I look at the landscape. And so I remember going to a club one night in L.A. I was sitting next to an attorney friend of mine at the time, and there was a band on stage. And I said, here's what's going to happen. That band on stage is going to get a deal for half a million dollars. They're going to make a really mediocre record because they don't have any great songs, but they're going to get signed because they have the right look and they're showing up and you're their attorney, so you can open up the door and do that. The, the label will lose a million dollars. Then they're going to get dropped by the second album. And I said, that's not sustainable. I said, at some point, the industry is going to crack uh, on that kind of weight on it. It's not going to work, you know, because they're looking too much in the short term and they're not developing. The reason that, um, and, and I, w I was all, ab all about artist development, that make records that you can make that are doable, that reflect where the artist is at at that time. Don't put the hype and pressure on, on the artist. Just make a real record and if it can get radio and airplay great and if it can't that's okay too because the artist can go that's me i believe in that record we're not trying to make a record that sounds like so and so that's on a, a video or a film or on tv if you could like i said if you can get success on those records that's fantastic but it's about artist development and having believed in it for such a long time that for me it's like you know i've been kind of like this you know, it's, it's like the turtle. I'm not even in the race because you guys are running so fast, you know, with, with, with all these expensive things going flying by me, you know, and all of a sudden that's coming to a, a, a stop. And I'm like, well, I'm still here doing it. So if you want to make a record for a low, you know, for a reasonable budget and develop your artistry, it's like... I'm the guy to talk to, you know, because nothing, I haven't looked at, I've been looking at that, it was not a popular thing to do, you know, 30, 35 years ago, that, you know, because everybody was still kind of enamored with, with the, the glam of it all, you know, the industry was still kind of, uh, in, in, you know, it was like overhyped and it was, uh, it was going through like a CD boom in the, in the late 80s and early 90s. Oh, our entire catalog is now on CD. And it's like, what does that have to do with artistry? What does that have to do with, with Sun Records and Elvis? Nothing. You know, and if it doesn't have anything to do with that, then I'm not your guy. <laughs> you know funny. what I mean? Yeah, so no, I'm too. not afraid of creating something that the major label can then invest in. I don't have a problem with that, you know? But to make it for that purpose, that's different. It's, it's not, it, to me, it's not where you end up. It's how do you get there? And if you can get there by creating your own point of view and, and you, you, your, your own, uh, I was earlier, like, can you create your own signature of sound? Everyone has their own way of writing their name. Everyone should have their own way of sounding, a point of view. When you, you know, it's like one of my favorite R is like Marvin Gaye. I listen to Marvin Gaye. The minute I hear like a what's going on, that album is like, I'm in. I'm in for life. I hear Bob Marley exit. I'm in. You know, if, if I hear, a, you know, like a Donovan record, boom, I'm in. I just know there's a sound, a point of view, you know. Uh, some of the Joni Mitchell records, whoever the artist is, it's like I'm captivated by the realism of it. It's, it here's the catch. It's not what it costs to make an album. It's what the album is worth. <laughs> Definitely. You know? So if somebody could spend a million dollars on a record, $500,000, $100,000 on a record, doesn't mean it has any value. <laughs> you know? Someone could go in the studio. If Jimi Hendrix were alive today, 
and he could go in and, and record for one hour. How valuable would that tape be? Exactly. <laughs> right? It would be invaluable, like bring Van Gogh back. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, my God, he's painting another painting. With this one more, this one more guitar song out of Jimi Hendrix. He might do another Angel or Little Wing. You know, no one listens to those records. And go, oh, those are really expensive sounding records. True. No, they were not. That's the whole point. Yeah, it's funny about making records. Uh, a lot of you're in the studio. And you're dealing with, uh, you know, I got a good buddy of mine that's working on some work for me right now for the work I'm doing in L.A. Yeah. Um, and sometimes he is so stuck on the process that I'm like, dog, like, I just want the results. And they don't care about how we did it. That's right. They don't care if it was, a, you know, Stax record, one, you know, microphone in the middle of the room and everything spaced right. out. That's right. You know, perfectly from the yep. mic. Or, well, well Stax is a really interesting thing because Stax was, was built in a very unusual room. It was like a theater. Uh -huh. So some of the room curved up. very, <laughs> And so you got part of the sound, right? And also... They were really into capturing performances, so oh, yeah. they might spend the day, you know, capturing a performance of, mm -hmm. of a band, but it was people playing together, mm -hmm. you know, so when you heard the crack of the snare, that, was, that wasn't like, oh, we're going to do the drums first, and then, you know, next week we'll do the bass, and, you know, huh. it, it wasn't like, no, we're going to capture, you know, so I don't want to comment negatively about anybody that you or anybody else is working with, but if they don't know... It sounds simple to get people in a room and push record. <laughs> What's the big deal? Yeah, it is not. Not everybody knows how to do it. I can tell you that firsthand. Mm -hmm. Not everybody, and your experience confirms that. So yeah. you want to get something, you go, where's my record? I've spoken to people that they come in the studio, it's happened to me a while ago, par parlor piano, right? Comes in the studio, so, for my comes to the studio and he plays a song with me, right? And then I say, hey, how's your record going? And he's on a major label. He goes, I don't know. I said, what do you mean? How can you not know how your record's going? Exactly. He goes, well, my producer won't let me hear the record because one day we do the drums, another day bass. So it's and not even put together. It's, it's, not even, it's just kind of like stacks of... You stuff. know, yeah. of stuff. It's not, I can't even say music. You know, like mm -hmm. Miles Davis says, hey, don't call my music stuff. <laughs> I don't make stuff. I make music. Hey, man, don't call this <laughs> shit stuff. That's exactly this right. This shit is music, man. Right. So that, that he, is dem he demanded respect for his art. And that's what this whole process is about. Do we respect the artist or do we want to turn art into stuff? And that is... I think the, the question for our times, and if you are not you personally, because I don't know your friend, but if you if if an artist does not feel that who they are working with is for their best interest, then they should consider taking a break <laughs> from the situation to say, I don't think you're on my side, you're on your side. Or you don't have the capacity to go where I need to go, because right. I want to fly. Right. And, and I have to say that you know, for me, I didn't even know what I wanted or, or even could, could start from that perspective. But as I've watched and as I experienced what Marvin was doing, he was always looking out for my best interest on that. I always felt that. You know, I mean, and maybe I didn't quite know how to express it, but the record we made then holds up today. And it's largely in part, largely because of what he, the vision that he had cast for it. And he helped me see that as well. So I, I would say that, you know, we might not make the same record a day if we get together, but I can say this, I think whatever record we, we did do, it would still have the longevity because what he does, he's, he's in it for the long haul. The, this record, it feels timeless. I mean, both of those records, when people, I played it for people, they, they say, this is like, when did you do this? This is like very contemporary, even though it might have been a while. But it's, it doesn't have any kind of, like he was saying, tricks or things about it. And that, uh, I would just, he may, may not be for everybody, but he was the right guy for me at the right time. And, and that's why we're still hanging. And we're even like talking right now about doing the next record. And we're going to try to write some stuff before we leave this. Because it worked once, it worked twice, third <laughs> time's a charm. 
<laughs> well, I think that's a beautiful place to conclude. What's that? I said that I think that's a beautiful place to conclude. Oh, okay. Yeah, man, that was great. Um, I, I get so distracted you... when I hear Marley. Oh, yeah, yeah, that was a crew. Oh, group, man. man. Yeah, man. Not, nothing is better than those records, man. Yeah, those stuff, right? I mean. Oh, yeah, he's got his history down, man. <laughs> so, um, you guys got anything you want to plug? What do you got going on? Well, Marv, I will pull it Marvin because he doesn't always plug himself. Marvin Country is out there, and he's got this double album set. And then he's also got another project with Willie Aaron, who is a good friend of his out in Los Angeles, and it's called the Holy Brothers. Both of those are things that you should go out and look for. T H E E, the Holy Brothers. <laughs> uh, other projects. A, a, a good friend of mine, Henry uh, Bariel, is a director. Uh, he just directed a, a, a new film that's going out in the festivals right now called Driver X. And so I've got about seven tracks in that. And we're actually talking about doing a new film together called My Name is Sparkle, which is the title of the Holy Brothers album. And he wants to build the uh, film around the character Sparkle. Because that album, the Holy Brothers album, was actually designed as a two-act play. So uh, we're, we're in talks of that. Um, Helen Rose has a debut album that I produced called Trouble Holding Back. And she just did a pledge campaign and hit over the 100% mark on it. So we're pressing it on vinyl. And uh, Molly Hanmer, H-A-N-M-E-R, uh, produced her debut album. And that's called uh, Stuck in a Daydream. And produced an EP for another artist, uh, Logan Heftel. And uh, that's called Chase the World. And Chase the World is also going to be a podcast that Logan's going to do. And, you know, so I'm working on another solo album called What's the Mood of the Country Now? And so it's kind of a lot of stuff at one time, you know, and it's really an exciting, uh, I think it's an exciting time because I think that, uh, I think this is the time to, to break barriers rather than resting on the sound that was. I love Bob Marley. I want to be influenced uh, by Marley, but I don't want to sit there and say, you know, I had the opportunity to work with Santa Davis, who, who played with Bob Marley, but I didn't say to him, let's make a track that sounds like Bob Marley. It was just kind of understood that I want to, I got you in here because I want that vibe, that energy, you know. Exactly. I remember one time working with an artist, and uh, we we did a... Uh, uh, we got to we got to work with Sa Santa Davis, and I said, you know, we should let's try cutting the vocals live in the studio. And the artist had never done that before. And he goes, I don't know, man, you know, because I'd never done that, and I think I'd rather overdub the vocals. And then Santa looks at him and goes, Well, you know, that's not how. Marley and Tosh would have done it, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. And so, as soon as, as soon as he says, I go, okay, let's cut it live. We're, let's bring the mic over, and then That's we cut fun. it live. And it was like it changed everything. Uh -huh. it changed everything because you want to get that spirit. Even, and I'll work with a net, meaning that I'll put your vocal live, you know. And if you say to me, oh man, I sang the wrong lyric. I'm changing the lyric. I want to do another vocal. Okay, that's fine. But if this works. Then we got it. It ain't broke. A lot of, you know. And so there's no rules to it. There's no rule book for doing any of this. But if, if there was a number one rule, surround yourself with people that you love and who believe in you and you love and you believe in them. If, you can, if that's the rule book, that's the end of the book. Everything else kind of falls into place. <laughs> Perfect. This has been The State of Folk.